And I may have to get it out. I don't want to, but I might have to because it's getting to be unattractive. Right. And um, but they stuck me so many times and I had bandages like up to here. And I was like, nope, that's not going to be no. cute. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> I'm going to have to get Right. I, I just want you to know that we totally understood, you know, it, it, <laughs> your health comes first. So, yes, yes. So, you know, this this sort of thing runs in my family. OK. On both sides, we have thyroid conditions, but none of it has ever been cancerous. But, you know. Can't take any chances. No, so. you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad that you've been taking care of it. So. Oh yeah, I have, I have. They they keep telling me um, after they examine me, my my thyroid numbers are where they should be, and they ask me, do you have any problems swallowing? I'm like, do I look like I have trouble swallowing? <laughs> I don't have any trouble swallowing. <laughs> So, and then they tell me it, it would be elected surgery. Oh. Who elects surgery, you know, and then they won't pay for it. So in order to oh. do this, I would have to lie and say, oh, yeah, I'm having lots of problems. Right. My motivation would be that it's that it's unattractive. You know what I mean? That's where I'm getting just. But then a cut all around your neck looks like somebody tried to kill you. That's not cute either. So I'm trying to decide what I'm going to do. So it's a shame for it to be, okay. you know. All right, Dr. Wright, if, if, if yes. you're ready, we're ready. I'm ready. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Okay. Do you, do you want me to count down? Okay. Yeah. All right. Oh. You're not talking to me. You're talking oh, no, to someone. I wasn't that time. <laughs> okay. I, just, just, yeah. So just so you know, you know, we're recording this for our special that uh, airs next week. And so okay. um, to That's start great. our conversation, I'll do a countdown from um, from three. Okay. All right. And then I'll do a little introduction. And then that's when I'll ask you some questions. Okay, great. All right. <laughs> All right. Here we go. <laughs> In three, two, one. Joining us as we kick off the conversation in the fight for environmental equity is a woman who knows it inside and out. Dr. Beverly Wright is the executive director for the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice. Dr. Wright, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, now for those who may not know or understand, what is environmental racism and what are different forms of it? So, um, Environmental racism for our, from our, our perspective, at least when I think about where we began, was the uh, um, um, disproportionate exposure of environmental pollutants to people of color communities. And for us, it was initially African-American communities because that's who we were working with in what's called Cancer, cancer Alley. It was also the unequal protection that existed because of the inability to enforce laws and regulations that could, in fact, protect communities. That's the definition on its surface. But if you really want to see what environmental racism is, is looking at, in our own backyard, Cancer Alley, or, or the corporations like to call it the Mississippi River Chemical Corridor, but communities call it Cancer Alley because our Cancer rates are so extremely high. We have some of the highest cancer rates in the nation. Of the top 10 cancers, Louisiana is first in seven of the top 10 cancers. And as a survivor of breast cancer myself, during my treatment at MD Anderson, when I got to the hospital and they asked me where I was from, the nurses said, oh, we get a lot from down there. Now, when you're standing out at a hospital that is that huge, they are seeing so many people from Louisiana, you know that we have a problem. But, but even when I think about what environmental racism looked like for me in the early 90s, it was, in fact, communities um, living fence line to huge facilities such as Shell and Exxon. When I say fence line, I mean, spitting distance from these huge pipelines that emitted cause, uh, cancerous uh, emissions 24-7, low-level 
missions, but through the pipes continuously. I saw communities whose window screens were rusting and falling off about every three months. You know, I saw communities with small white crosses on their front lawns to show the number of people in their homes who had died from cancer, the moss on the trees dying, cars run, riding around with, with circles where the paint had disappeared and circles that looked lunar in some manner or something from out of space. And people sick and tired of being, as they say, sick and tired, vegetation only growing on the opposite side of down, being downwind from these facilities and flaring at night to the point that they had to put dark curtains up because it was like daylight at, at late at night and unbelievable fear, unbelievable health problems, all the small animals disappearing where they used to fish and hunt. That was, for me, environmental racism and the fact that white people had been, been relocated from, um, from close proximity to these facilities while Black people were left to languish. And my center, the Deep South Center, conducted a GIS mapping, the first ever done in the corridor. And we found that 80% of African Americans live within three miles of a polluting facility. And it wasn't just one, it was multiple facilities. And it created a map of strange fruit. That's the way I describe it. Because the map in some areas had so many facilities that you could barely see the, the actual um, community on the map. So our communities have been exposed to what we call cumulative impacts. And that is why whenever we would go to court to fight the, the, the plants and its emissions, we would lose. Because the types of cancers that our communities had did not fit very neatly into um, the description of what, what emissions were being released at plants and what particular cancers it caused. So we didn't have an embryo toxin. We didn't have a neurotoxin. And the cancers that we had were not neuro or embryo. And that's what they said that their chemicals would cause. So we have been losing that battle because science had not caught up with what was going on in our communities. But that gap is being closed. And we're now able to determine something more than one chemical at a time for one disease. We now know what combinations of these things do. And I guess environmental racism also is the what I would call uh, being disenfranchised. In other words, white peak communities were able to move because their politicians listened to them. When I talked to black communities and said, well, what's that area right over across the street from you where they're just pollens, uh, pollens on the ground? What was that? They say, oh, that's where white people used to live. And the boss told us he would be back. That was eight years ago. So you literally had white people being better protected from pollution in the corridor than black people. That's environmental racism as well. Right. Uh, so the... Um Deep South Center for Environmental Justice. You know, it is um, a community un university, uh, community model, so to say, uh, partnership organization. What does that mean and how does it help with uh, environmental justice? Okay, so the community model is a model that I developed or advanced um, with the work that, I'm, that I do in the corridor. And it really evolved out of um, what I would call my own experiences. And that is as a college professor, um, working in communities and finding out that there were many questions that community people had that needed to be answered scientifically. In other words, you needed a toxicologist or you needed an epidemiologist. You needed to be able to connect with ATSCR. That's the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry or the Center for Disease Control, none of which communities had, but all universities had connections to all of these things, the so science plus connections to agencies. And so the idea was that you would bring communities together with researchers, but that that relationship would be of equal balance so that you don't have researchers not respecting the knowledge of communities and communities, you know, not trusting um, researchers who often came to work with them just to get tenure. 
So it was a whole transformation of the relationship between communities and universities. And we started in New Orleans with uh, Xavier University and Tulane University that has now expanded to about 32 HBCUs in five states, working with us on, on environmental justice issues in those areas. And so it was a, a slow rolling process for me as a researcher, teaching at the University of New Orleans, trying to find answers to questions, trying to find funding for questions, and then finally doing what sociologists are taught, ask the question. So I began asking communities, what's your, what do you see as a problem and what do you want fixed and how do you think we should do it? And when I did that, I finally was able to get some grants funded that actually, be, that actually help communities in the way that they wanted to be helped and provide community people with resources to do the work that we wanted them to do. So in a nutshell, that's the community university model. And our center works from that position. Everything is bottom up. So we don't do anything that communities don't ask us to do. We don't try to answer any questions that communities don't agree with. And it's called a, a community university model. Mm -hmm. And I know um, with when you mentioned, you know, working with the people in those communities, you, you've done some work with those people to where it helps them learn about what's happening around them, but also uh, employing them as well. Talk about that. Yes, well, that's interesting. Everything is connected in the work that I've done for almost 30 years. And so in working with communities to um, attend hearings and and to advocate for themselves to get emission reduction in the corridor. Our communities were always very happy with the services that we presented, all the classes and connections. But I remember um, uh, at one community, um, when we had finished fighting the battle that we were having, that uh, one, one lady said to me, and her name was Miss West, and she was actually, uh, lives in, in St. James Parish. And she said, you know, Dr. Wright, um, we appreciate everything that you do, but when you leave, our community is still poor. Our young people don't have any jobs and we really need to have jobs. And so the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences just happened to recognize that they needed a program that included minorities, and we were one of the first grantees of this program that's now been in existence for 25 years, where we train young men and women in hazardous waste, light abatement, basic construction, green construction, and we're trying to move on into renewables um, so that we'll train young people to do things like solar panels and so on. And what that does is it actually allows communities who are devastated from environmental pollution, but also living in poverty, get an economic boost from working to clean up their own communities. And not only that, travel the, the, the United States, helping other communities to be clean. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Dr. Wright, uh, thank you for joining us. And you just shared some very good information that of course will help in the fight for environmental equity. Thanks again. Thank you. All right. Dr. So are we Wright, done? We are good. Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. <laughs> My, believe it or not, one eye just started running water out of the blue. I'm like, Oh, you would pick now. <laughs> Probably makeup or something in my eye. <laughs> well, but, you know, you. I've been doing this for a long time. As you know, I do two and three a day sometimes. Yeah. So today I only have two. This is a, a short day. Okay. But, well, you know, the president is coming in town. So yes. I'm hoping to be one of the people at one of the hearings because of whatever he's going to do. Um, I know my name has been sent up to accompany him. I'll have something to talk about again if, if I get to be in his meeting. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Well, nice meeting you. Same here. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're a busy woman. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. All right, have a good Bye -bye. one. Bye-bye.